today's webinar, what is it? Today is our, it is our penultimate webinar of the week and it is entitled Climate Change, Impacts on our Inland Fisheries. And our guest speaker today is Dr. Kieran Byrne. Kieran has a degree in zoology and a PhD in freshwater fish parasitology from Trinity College Dublin. He has recently stepped down as CEO of Inland Fisheries Ireland following the successful completion of his second five-year term. Kieran has been part of Ireland's delegation to the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organization, otherwise known as NESCO, for over 15 years and is currently chairman of the International Atlantic Salmon Research Board. Kieran is in a unique position to understand the impacts of climate change on Ireland's fish populations. Kieran, you're very welcome at today's webinar. Thank you for taking the time to join us and to talk to us about climate change and our inland fisheries. And now over to you. Thanks, Sarah. Appreciate the introduction. <clears throat> I'm now going to try and do the technical piece of sharing my screen. And here we go. We should be okay. Now, um, I'll just double check. I think I need to change display settings. There we go. Can you see that? Perfect. Just, uh, Thank you, Kieran. Okay. Hi, guys. Um, there's a small but select group of people here today, so I very much appreciate you jumping in. And I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change impacts on inland fisheries. But before I start, I just want to make you aware of one of the videos my colleagues have produced about the climate change program in IFI. So it's John Coyne, um, James Barry and Fiona Kelly have done a wonderful video, which will be made available after this little presentation. And they've gone into quite a bit of detail on some of the work they're specifically doing on climate change. I'm just going to talk a little bit at a higher level and give some sense of where things are going and what's important. So before we start, I guess it's always important to talk uh, about definitions, right? And some of you may have sat in on a, a webinar, I think on Tuesday of this week uh, with Evan Tuzak, uh, talking about weather and things like that. So you might've seen this already, but um, I'm assuming probably may, many of you have not. I'm, and I'm also assuming that not everybody has the full knowledge. So first of all, climate is not equal to weather and it's all to do with kind of the, uh, the length of time really. Weather is about short-term conditions. So when we have a conversation about what the weather will be like over the bank holiday weekend or weather next week, or et cetera, or the weather last week, it's short-term. Climate, on the other hand, broadly speaking, is the average daily weather for an extended period. And when we're talking about climate, we really are talking about extended periods of years, decades, and in some cases, millennia. And we're all familiar with climate change, but what that actually means is a shift in ambient temperature regime. So you have an increase in frequency, how often things happen, and also the intensity, how severe they are in extreme weather events. So that's what climate change is all about. So we're talking about climate, so it's a longer term perspective on fisheries rather than just what's happening this week or next week or last month or you know, next month. This one, uh, the next definition is a nice one, uh, if you can say it, it's a great one, poikilotherm. I'm sorry, it's a bit of a zoological one, but the poikilotherm in its broadest sense is an animal whose body temperature varies with the external surroundings and fish are poikilotherms. Now there's various, if you're a zoologist, there's various flavors of this, but we'll keep it simple for the moment. So an animal whose body temperature varies with external surroundings, such as a fish, such as a reptile, etc. And what's important now is their body functions are critically dependent on the environmental temperature. So we're all very familiar with the nature documentaries that David Attenborough and whatnot, where they, uh, you know, the lizards and the snakes bask on the rocks until they get to a certain temperature and they can move off. Well, fish are poikilotherms. They're very much influenced by their surrounding temperature. And what you can see there is that little word in red, thermal optima. Every species has a range of temperatures at which it's comfortable and it can live happily. So both an upper temperature and a lower temperature. And different species, fish, birds, humans, got every, everybody, is adapted to different thermal optima, and particularly fish. So you have some fish are more adapted to higher levels, some are adapted to lower levels, even though they're all fish. The surrounding temperature impacts on their particular bodily functions. That's quite important in the context of climate change because fish live in water, obviously, and being uh, impacted by um, the surrounding temperature has impacts on what you do, or what the fish does itself. We just look at climate change first from an environmental perspective. Um, many of you are probably aware of this, but just to kind of remind you again, the IPCC, which is the International Panel on Climate Change, which is kind of the, um, the body for climate change, if you want, uh, predicts that the planet will warm to about 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels by 2030. Now, anybody who's following this kind of climate piece will realize that, A, first of all, the original prediction was uh, two degrees by 2050. So it looks like we're actually warming uh, a bit faster. And there is regular updates and reports. And even on yesterday on the newspaper, it's talking about the speed at which glaciers are melting. So it's as we're getting more information, we're realizing that 
climate change is happening even faster than we kind of thought right the way around the world. But just in the Irish context, uh, the changes in Ireland are broadly in line with those identified for the global trends. So in Ireland, we would have had, nobody's old enough to remember them, but we would have had a warming period between the 1920s and 1940s. And actually, the mid-1940s had a significant cool period. And I think, I believe it's 1947 um, was one of the most severe winters. And if you recall, a couple of years back, we had a very severe winter. And all the talk was of 1947. And the, I suppose a lot of the older people remember the very harsh winter of 47. From about the late 1980s until the present day, we've had this warming period. And really, it's just increased. And again, I'm sure Evelyn, I think, touched on this on, on her um, uh, lecture, but really a lot of our records, and if you have any follow these in kind of the, uh, the meteorological records, an awful lot of the me meteorological records have all been broken and rebroken in recent years. So when you look at like the 10 hottest years on record, we're all recorded in the last 15 years, that kind of stuff. So what we're seeing is this greater level of warming, um, greater level of precipitation, changes in our climate. We expect the mean annual air temperature to increase by 2.5 degrees by 2055. And again, this is back to the weather v climate. Of course, we'd all love it to be 2.5 degrees warmer tomorrow afternoon when we're relaxing at the bank holiday weekend. But what we're talking about is the overall average temperature over a long period of time. And that has significant implications in terms of biology and ecology and also fisheries. We also expect wetter winter and autumn. So they think between 15 and 25% uh, wetter by the end of the century. And the frequency of heavy precipitation, which is rainfall events, increasing by up to 20%. So really the prediction for Ireland in terms of weather is gonna be broadly speaking, warmer and wetter, okay? Go back to fish again, that has significant imp implication for our fish populations. What happens to them and I suppose how we manage them. So if you look at it, uh, warmer waters, what does that mean for fish or means for water generally? You have extension of the growing season. Now, we don't necessarily think of a growing season in the context of rivers and lakes, but they all have a whole biota of plants and little microorganisms, things like that. And if it's warmer and for longer, um, you have an extension of the, of the growing season. All those little kind of microorganisms, uh, the phytoplankton and, and uh, zooplankton in lakes and rivers, um, will increase. They're prime part of the primary productive cycle. And the warmer water, uh, and the kind of the warmer weather generally uh, will increase the amount of primary production. To flick on to the kind of the volume side of it, what we're seeing, and we're seeing it already, is greater uh, numbers of flood events in terms of flooding, and equally that's matched by greater levels in the amount of drought events. And again, um, anybody who's probably looked at the weather or kept in tune with it over the last number of years has seen that, in, in, in certainly in the last year or two, we've had some really wet uh, springs which have been followed by effectively drought periods in autumn. And I think it was last year I recall seeing that on the news that farmers, they couldn't get the potatoes out of the field because the fields are too wet. And then by the time you got them out and replanted them, a couple of weeks later, the fields had dried out. So the next crop had actually failed to germinate because it was too dry. But some of the impacts of fishing, uh, of flooding and drought on, on fisheries for, for, for our perspective really is uh, destruction of habitat. So you can actually have, now that might be a permanent destruction or it might be a temporary destruction because if the habitat's not available to the fish species when they need it, right, uh, well, it's effectively gone from them, so it might as well be destroyed. You've got things like sediment loading. So when you have significant flood events, what the flood does is effectively scour the river. It can really resuspend sediments and you end up with a large amount of sediment loading, which can kind of reinvigorate nutrients and things like that. You can cause increases in humic content, which is the brown uh, coloring you see in, in, in waters. And particularly if you've ever seen a river in flood, you'll see that always looks brown. And all of those things tend to drive that primary production. So what it means from fish, Loss of habitat, or so in other words, and again, that could be temporary or it could be permanent, but really it's all about relative to particular fish species, because if the habitat is gone from the fish when it needs it, it might as well be a permanent loss of habitat. Another thing is distribution of fish species, both where they are in the river, which is a very localized distribution, but at a climate and a larger scale level, you have to look at distribution of fish species generally, and I'll touch on that a little bit later on. The abundance, um, and the abundance is the number of fish species in a river. So as fish biologists, we look at two things. We look at presence, absence, whether something's present in a lake or river or not. So you get a plus or minus, but also you look at the abundance, how many of them are present in a lake. So for example, you might have trout present in a river. That's great. But the number, the abundance of trout might be a lot less than what it used to be. Another thing that can be impacted is phenology, which is known as timing. And obviously we're talking about animals. 
So they are, they are more than we're animals. They have their cycles, their circadian cycles that they go through uh, all, every season, every day, every night. And the timing of various life stages and things that happen um, can be very much impacted by water temperature. So let me give an example of salmon. Salmon lay their eggs in kind of October, November. And we reckon it's about 450 to 530 degree days before the eggs hatch. What that means is that, for example, if a, if a, if a, a day if it was 10 degrees Celsius in the day, that'd be 10 degrees days. So for uh, salmon eggs to hatch at 450 degree days, you want to have 45 degrees or 45 days for the temperature was 10 degrees. So the impact of climate change on temperature and timing is that if you have warmer water, it takes less degree days for the eggs to hatch. And that might be a great thing, but all of these cycles are natural cycles and the kind of the hatching of the eggs is timed to when there's actually food in the river. So you can end up with situations where uh, certain cycles are accelerated and they actually mismatch their biological window. For example, we see this uh, in some of the smaller, um, the smaller songbird species where, you know, chicks are being laid earlier, chicks are coming out earlier and they're mismatching with when the food source is available. Similarly, back to salmon again, the juvenile salmon, uh, what they're called smolts, that's the stage of the salmon where it goes out to sea. And smoltification is the process was when they turn from these kind of par, they silver up and they get ready for a big migratory journey out to sea. But that process is two parts. One part is a physiological process, which can be speeded up because of warmer temperature. And the other part is an environmental process that the smolts have to wait until the right environmental windows come along. So if you get a flood event or the right level of water. So the climate change can impact the smolt in both of those areas. And we have seen situations, for example, where we believe the fish are uh, maturing quicker because it's warmer, migrating earlier. And one of the big concerns is that the smolts, the juvenile salmon are getting down to the estuaries when there's not sufficient stocks of food uh, for them to feed on. And even this year, I believe this year we had a, in one or two of our locations, we had because of the, the dynamics of the weather, we had the entire smolt run taking place in four and five days, where previously it might be stretched out over a couple of weeks. Yeah. The, last, the other thing then to look at is the species composition, the community structure. So it's how the different, uh, what kinds of fish species are present and how they kind of interact with each other. And that can all be changed again from, um, as a result of climate change. And I'll give you a lovely little picture here of the Dinan River, which is down in Castle Comer. And you can see here when you're talking about the habitat loss and that lovely little picture, you can see it's a grand little stream, but all that cobble to the right hand side and little bank is quite potentially trout and salmon habitat, juvenile trout and salmon habitat, and potentially for other species as well. And that's not available to those fish. And you can see just from the look of the river that the river is in very low water conditions. So just give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, oh, can you see that one? Yeah. Okay, you can see that. that's the river feel. Now this idea of climate change impacting fisheries is not, you know, in 10, 20, 30 years time or something into the future. It's happening right now. Now it's taken from a particular perspective granted, but you can see there that the water is only millimeters, well inches deep possibly at, at, at best. And that one is what I'm talking about in terms of habitat for fisheries. So two things going on with that photograph. One, the water is very, very shallow. Two, it's a beautiful sunny day. That water will heat up to quite extended uh, temperatures and impact in fish. And well, a third thing going on as well is the dissolved oxygen level, which fish require to breed, can actually really decrease in warmer waters. So all of a sudden, what looks like a beautiful river becomes a very challenging habitat for trauma, uh, salmon and trout and other species. Another example is the River Deal in Cross Maligning County Mayo. And that chap there you see in the centre holding what looks like a pole and a big backpack. He's doing a thing called electrofishing. And what he's actually doing is the electrofishing throws a little shot of current into the water and it stuns the fish uh, very gently and he can pick them up and put them in a bucket. And what the, our staff member there is doing is he's actually taking fish out of that pool and putting them into a bucket and transferring them to a different part of the river where they'll have better conditions and they'll actually survive. If we didn't do that, it's highly likely that pool would either completely dry out or the temperature would get too high for fish and they'd die, the oxygen levels would decrease, or what happens as well is the heron would land and it would just clean up everything in the pool. And that's happened on the River Deal, a small section of the River Deal. But if you can imagine that happening right the way across the country and think about the impacts of that on our fish populations. Again, to give you an example of it, this is the River, uh, the river Duff uh, near Bundoran. And the picture on the left hand side, you can see there's some kind of riffles and pools here, but the big rocks are exposed. So while there is some small bits of deeper water, there's quite a considerable uh, reduction in the amount of uh, suitable habitat for fish at that time of year. And just the, the, the main picture then is a little feeder stream, uh, which would be feeding into the duff. 
uh, at the same time. And that is, for all extents and purposes, dry. So that's a complete loss of habitat. So our juvenile salmon and trout uh, that would live in that type of feeder stream have effectively no habitat. So their choice is probably in some cases, if they can make it down to the main river, they can make it down, but they're much more susceptible to predation and things like that. Uh, another example is the Kong Canal. Um, and again, in May 2020, completely dries out. And the, this one here is the Dunkellen River. Now, the last two photographs, the Kong Canal and the Dunkellen River, they do tend to dry out anyway on a yearly basis. Um, so I have a question coming in here. Shade be enough to keep us. Yep, yeah, I'll come back to that. So what we're going to do, I'll come back. It's a great question. But the, the, these rivers dry out anyway. But what's happening now is it's it's greater, it's more exacerbated, it's longer. Now I just wanted to, the picture here. You see the chap on the left. He's also doing that same job again. He's electrical fishing the fish out of the pool so we can put them in a book and move them somewhere else. Uh, and my staff colleague there, Eamon, is holding a fantastic sea trout, and you can see what what looks like a deeper pool behind them. But I can tell you now, if we didn't remove that fish from that pool, it would be extremely challenged. You think about that fish sitting in really high water temperature, hot, low levels of oxygen, low flows for a potentially extended period of time. What state that fish would be in by the time it gets upstream to spawn. So that's why we do this work. Now, of course, um, let me see now. No, it seems to be going. We're having a little bit of a wobble here on the technical side. Hang on a sec. Now, sorry about this. Now, we, my, my thingy seems to have slowed down and it's not allowing me to. Oh. Okay, now. Sorry, we're just having a small little technical problem here. My computer seems to have stopped. Okay. Now, uh, one moment. Stop share for one moment. My, I've, I've got my internet. Um, now, now we we'll try this again. We're trying to reshare again here. Stop share. Now, and we just Now, sorry about that. What we need here is some kind of slide. Okay. And what I need to do here then is. Now, can somebody give me a little thumbs up? Maybe uh, our text just let me know that we're back on track. We're good, Kieran. Yep. Yep. Great. Sorry about a little technical wobble. It is that you know, as I say, the air is human. To really screw up, one needs a computer. Anyway, we're just talking about the drought side of it. Flick to the other side of it now. The flooding piece. This was not taken in some kind of Amazonian river. This is the Owen Glynn River in Clifton. It's quite a dramatic photograph and it would have appeared on the news. Uh, and this was around September of last year. And it was a relatively speaking a flash flood. So kind of what I was talking about there, you can see the color, the humid content, the brown, and the level and intensity of that water is something to behold. So that is like one big scouring pad going down to the river and impacting on the fish populations and habitats. I mentioned at the start of the talk, uh, that my colleagues done a video on the climate change program on IFI, and they have some really phenomenal footage uh, of the River Erif, a big flood in the River Erif. And just to give you a sense of what they have in the, uh, and you have to see it to really believe it. But in the Erif, in about February of 2020, we had rainfall levels that are one, up to 1.65 meters per hour. That's the level of rainfall that was falling, the intensity of rainfall. And they had a massive flood on the River Eris. That was in February. By April, we effectively had drought conditions. So you're flicking from this kind of massive flood to the drought conditions. All the while, the poor little fish species are having to survive in that and get all of their nutrients and their body timber from that. So that's a really dramatic impacts on fish populations. And these kind of flood events can really, in a sense, scour out a river and can come fundamentally impact both the habitat and also the fish in the river at the time. I want to talk a tiny bit now about temperature. We talked at the start, well, I talked at the start anyway, fish are pycothermic, so they're entirely reliant on external surroundings, um, which is the water temperature for their bodily functions. I mentioned at the start that they have thermal optima, which is a kind of range of temperatures in which they can successfully and happily live. And we all have that, all species have that. A little clip here from the Irish Times, and this goes back to the wonderful summer of 2018. Now, as a, you know, as a God-fearing member of the public, it was a wonderful summer. From a fisheries biology perspective, we got really, really close to a very significant 
problem for fisheries. So the, the weather kind of broke, if I recall rightly, about kind of end of July, early August. But had the weather not stayed going at the really hot temperatures, we would have had very significant problems with white array across the country in fisheries. So an example is Neowen Rift, where again, we have a lot of climate change monitoring going on. We had lethal water temperatures of 24.7 degrees over 13 days. And that time of temperature was lethal for salmonids. So what you had was accelerated temp elevated temperatures over an extended period of time. Okay, the average temperature was 18.6 degrees for June, and they actually reached a maximum at one point of 28 degree water temperature. That's in a little kind of relatively shallow lake system in Connemara and just out the back of Uktarar there in that system, which is dominated by, well, it should be dominated, it should be dominated by salmonids, which are trout and salmon, which are cool water species, or cold water species, and I'll come back to that. But it wasn't just on the Owen Riff River, right the way across the country. So in a little table there, you can see in the Arif, that river, I uh, just referenced that in the video, we got water temperatures of 25.6 degrees. In the Clodia and Offaly, 22. The Dargal, 21.5. Bandon, 23. Munster Blackwater, 20.7. All of these high points, but also extended periods of warm water. But not only did we have warm water, we had again, don't forget, no rainfall, so there wasn't very much warm water, and the oxygen level, dissolved oxygen levels decrease, in some cases precipitously. So the two little fish species you see here, uh, you shouldn't recognize them, but maybe if you're an aquarium hobbyist, you might. The little one on the left is a platy, and are typically found in the Mexican Isthmus and Peninsula, and same with the little one on the right, which is called an albino cori. The reason I put those in is because I breed them, and both of those fish species are tropical fish species, and they would have happily lived in Irish rivers in 2018 and all of those water temperatures they would have been happy to live in. So that'll give you a sense of what we're talking about here and we're talking about this kind of climate. Just to put some perspective on it. You could have put your tropical fish into some of those rivers during the summer of 2018 and they would have survived fine. So let's come back to the climate change environment. So I haven't read the predictions of future impacts are not straightforward. As ever, this happens typically with most biological systems. There is rarely ever a single smoking gun, if you want to call it that. It just doesn't happen that way. So what you've got is a complex of climate change related pressures, which is your flooding, your changing rainfall in terms of increased precipitation, temperature fluctuations and drought. They're all related to the climate change piece, but they're not happening in isolation. They have to be mixed in with the non climate pressures that are there anyway. So barriers to fish migration that impound fish, habitat change, pollution, increased nutrient levels, potential for invasive species. So really it's very difficult to predict exactly uh, what's going to happen because you have a mixture of those climate and non-climate related factors. But broadly speaking, well, we know the picture is going to change. And in the context of Ireland and Ireland's uh, kind of biota fish species, it's probably not going to be a very um, positive picture. But I suppose the key message is not every species or location will be impacted in the same way. And I mean, for the fish people amongst you, you know, the, the, the anglers, I've got a roach and a bream, which are two of our coarse species. And they're probably, those coarse fish species are probably likely to do a bit better in, the cli in many of the climate change scenarios because it'll be warmer water, greater product, uh, productivity, which they're used to, than the salmonids, which are kind of cooler water species. And I'll touch on that a bit more. So just in terms of the fish themselves, uh, you might recognize that, Europe, I, know, I don't think it's drawn to scale, um, but we're basically biogeographically, we're on the northwest shoulder of Europe. We're right out there in the corner and kind of next stop is Iceland and kind of Canada and kind of North America. We were glaciated, which is fully glaciated until about 10,000 years ago. And there's a whole scholarly debate as to when exactly the glaciers retreated and whatnot. But suffice to say, up until about 10,000 years ago, we had ice cover. The first kind of fish species, habitats back were tundra-like habitats, and the first species, the fish species back were um, uh, what we call post-glacial colonizers, and they were dominated by the cold water species. I said we're biogeographically isolated, so we're species poor, and it's not just in fish, it's in birds and plants and everything. We're just at the edge of the range for many, many species. But also, if you look at where we are, we're about bang in the middle between the kind of the range of the northern species coming down and the southern species coming up. And that plays back to the point I made about distribution. Distribution of fish, but within uh, rivers and lakes, distribution of fish across the country, and also distribution of fish across countries is going to change in the climate change scenario. So what we're seeing at a, at a European level, the kind of warmer water species in Central and Lower Europe are being able to migrate further north, and the colder water species, you know, would, would come down as far as Ireland, are migrating further north as well. 
So Ireland, we've about 28 fish species, depending who's counting. Um, compared to the UK, is about 50, give or take, and France has uh, about 99. Now, I put in a place many years ago, I had the pleasure of working in a place called Lake Neuseidersee in Austria. That lake alone in Austria had 29 fish species in it. So our fish species can be broadly broken into three groups. The cold water species, which were the post-glacial colonizers, the first ones into Ireland after the glaciation, and they're dominated by the trouts, the chars, the eels, pollen, lamprey. Cool water species that can deal with, you know, the cooler waters, pike and perch, and then the warmer water species, such as the roach, bream, and some of the other coarse fish species. And again, taking what we know about water temperatures and climate change over the longer period, the ones that are probably going to do a bit better are the warmer water species, and the ones that are probably going to be impacted a bit more are the cold water species. So just give you a little example. Um, sorry, the response of lakes and rivers, of course, again, is not going to be uniform because not all rivers and lakes, particularly lakes, are the same. And, it and, and that re really relates to their depth, you know, their trophic status, where they're located. Now, trophic status is the amount of nutrients. Some of them are very, for example, if you went up, up a high mountain and found a curry lake, it could be quite deep, but it could be very, very poor in terms of nutrients and uh, invertebrates and plants and things like that. So it's very poor status. Other lakes, typically in the Midlands, tend to be more shallow and tend to be a lot more enriched in terms of kind of their flora and fauna and their kind of their productivity level. So it depends on a lot of those factors. They do not all respond the same way. And also in many cases, lakes are quite large water bodies. So even within a large water body, you can have different types of responses going on. Because some lakes I know have like deep pools, others don't, others are more flat bottomed. So just give an example, uh, cold water species most impacted, and do I have it? Yeah, the Arctic char. And unfortunately, it's a picture of a char in the bank of the river. It's one of our, uh, it's a Corrigon, it's one of our early colonizers after the glaciation. So we reckon in the climate change scenarios, there'll be a significant loss of range in the Arctic char. And also, already in recent decades, we've seen uh, quite a loss of uh, char from a number of our lakes. But a recent piece of scientific research in Canada reckoned that there'll be a 63% reduction in range. In Sweden, they reckon a 73% reduction in range. And in Ireland, going back to that distribution point, we're actually really at about the southern end of the distribution of Arctic char in Europe. And we're gonna be under extreme pressure, whereas in places like Norway and Finland, there's still quite good stocks of um, Arctic char. Um, the other one then is first order streams. So example of the little one I showed you on the River Duff, you know, these are the small, what look like almost in some cases drains, tiny little streams, which can be really important uh, nursery habitat and spawning habitat for our brown trout and our salmon. And we reckon because of the dynamics of the particular life cycle, salmon themselves will probably be most impacted. And this little picture that just popped up as one uh, I'm, you know, I'm kind of referring to. But just go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, what you're seeing there is the Cahar Mar uh, Morris River, which is a little tributary of, uh, in Hedford, and ultimately it'll flow into Loch Carra. But that again is taken in May of 2020. So it's not like hundreds of years ago. This is last year, right? Um, now, this section of the river dries out uh, most years. Now, and that's because a lot of the, 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 the landscape or the kind of geology around that part of the world is what they call karst. And it's kind of a lot of um, underwater flows and kind of sinkholes and kind of um, swallow holes and things like that. Um, and turlocks. So it's a very interesting kind of geology. But no, it's only, it gives a great example because that picture there, you can see that the river is fenced off, which is lovely, keeping the livestock out. But you've got this massive amount of ripe, uh, vegetation in the river. And effectively, by the time that photograph was taken, you've only got a couple of pools left. But shortly before that photograph was taken, our staff would have gone on and done the electrofishing. And they took out 120 trout and 60 salmon fry. So they did a single pass and the fry now at this stage are tiny, they're very small. And he would have taken those fish out and moved them down toward a section where there is more water. They went back a few days later and took another 74 trout and 42 salmon fry. But that's only one small, the point I want to make there is that's one small section of one small river. But two things happen. If those fish are sitting in those pools for a long time, think about their stresses on them. How are they doing in terms of the water heating up, oxygen levels going down? But even if they are moved, they're moved to a section further down the river, are they more vulnerable to predation? What happens to the fish species that are already present in that section of the river? Is there too many fish relative to the amount of feeding present? What impacts does that have? So the other thing I want to talk about then is in terms, and it's kind of ties into one of the questions is, you know, what, the modification, what we now know we're doing a lot of work on is that the morphology or the structure of the river really impacts on how the river or the lake responds to climate change, particularly the river. Now, I'm sorry about this. This is the most complex thing I have to show you now today. 
and the title it's a scientific paper um which is published in fisheries management and ecology by by some of the, our um our other uh, research team members and it says river modification reduces climate resilience of brown trout populations in ireland and what we mean by river modification is where we have a fully naturalized channel the normal kind of flows meanders and riffle glide pool sequence the channel has a much greater chance of being able to withstand some of these climate changes and these climate shocks so in this little graph here you see on the green on the left hand side is this eco high mo state and that means the eco hydromorphological state in other words how natural is the channel so you see where it's highly natural channel, so it hasn't been modified, hasn't been drained or straightened or anything like that, highly natural, and the temperatures are lower, the population is dominated by trout, right, which is classic. So it's cold water flowing, high levels of oxygen, cooler water temperatures. But as you moderate, as you modify the channel and the temperatures increase, you can see the population changes from trout dominance to co-dominance to a minnow and stone lodge dominance. So the population structure is changing. So the resilience of that particular piece of water is reduced in terms of its ability to withstand climate, uh, climate change. And let me just kind of maybe put a, um, a, a couple of pictures on this. But before I get there, I want to talk about, again, what we're trying to do now is uh, in climate change, you hear two things. One is uh, two phrases. One is called mitigation, and the other one's called adaptation. And mitigation is, in a sense, taking out the source of some of the climate uh, emissions in the first place. So, you know, changing your electric vehicle to a CO2 vehicle, or a, um, sorry, changing your, your diesel vehicle to an electric vehicle, you're mitigating because you're stopping the emissions. But what we have to do in the fisheries settings is adaptation, which is adapting to the responses to climate change. So, let me give an example of that. This uh, is a clear river. So we talked about the eco-hydrological state of the river. That looks like a canal. And that is what we would call a heavily modified water body. But let me take you around that photograph from a climate and fisheries perspective. First of all, you can see it's what we call a trapezoidal channel. So you effectively have the side and the side and broadly speaking, a flat bottom. So it's almost like a canal. What you can see from that photograph too is that the water is extremely linear. It all looks exactly the same. So there's very little what we call fluvial diversity, which in a normal channel is the fast flowing ripples, the glide section and a deep pool. And each of those types provide different habitats for fish. So it all looks very much the same. You can see on the left hand bank, what looks like an extra little bank. And that would have been the spoils taken out when that river was originally drained. Now we started draining rivers in probably about the 1840s around the famine. And more or less, more or less associated with uh, agricultural practice and developing agricultural practice is this idea of draining rivers to make land more productive. And right away to the 50s, 60s, 70s, we drained and drained and drained a lot of rivers. And we left a lot of rivers like this. So their ecological and morphological state is very much, it's a, they're very heavily modified. And this will have significant consequences in terms of climate resilience of that river. The other point is, look at the amount of shading available. You've got one bush in the middle there, but if you have a very, very hot day, there's virtually no shading, no pools, nothing uh, for, for fish to hide in or under. Again, that's a different section of the river. Now you do have some shading here on the right hand side from the trees, and this is the Clare River again, but you can see it's very straight. To a large extent, the water flow is very linear. And again, in terms of fluvial diversity, not very much, not a great scenario for fish in terms of this new climate change scenario. Um, another example is the Hind River in County Roscommon. And again, there's hardly a bush sheltering this river. And that will have significant impacts for the fish species in that river as well if it starts to warm up. And don't forget, if you're in a drought period, you're, you're typically, A, is reducing the flow of water, B, is increasing the temperature, and C, you're decreasing the amount of dissolved oxygen for fish. So you have a lot of things going on. So the question then was, how do we adapt? What can we do, right? And that feeds into a lot of the development works we're now pushing on with the IFI. So the team are looking and saying, well, what things can we do now that will have beneficial impacts in 10, 15, 20, 30 years time? The little picture on the right is a classic naturalized river channel. So you can see the little oxbow lakes and the meanders. That's how a river looks, a natural morphological state. And of course, we associate development with straightening all those out. And we nearly have to go back to that. And you'll see when you look around, there's a lot of programs around Europe where they're talking about reconnecting the rivers and, you know, bringing the rivers back to our natural state, etc. Because we've looked at it and we've seen the studies that say, in reality, um, to do... Um, to, to, to kind of build that kind of resilience into rivers and for fish, we have to get back to that naturalized state. 
Okay, so when you're looking at riparian planning as one thing we can do. The little photograph on the right is actually from my colleagues in the LOX agency, and you can see the little green sticks, uh, sticks coming up. They're planting uh, various appropriate types of trees relatively close to the water. The little trees will grow up and they will provide a kind of a cooling corridor for that river. Now, of slight concern in that photograph, as you can see in the background, is there's a, a forestry plantation there. And we now know that many of the forestry plantations are A, planted way too close to the rivers, so they're right close to the rivers, uh, and B, they're monocultures, so very little, uh, they do very, very little in terms of diversity or underleaf cover, which provides feeding for fish. Planting is one solution, which I'd be very, very careful as well, because if you overplant, what happens, you, have, you end up with tunneling, and that in itself decreases productivity. So it's trying to find that fine line between having a sufficient amount of planting, which provides a shading, which uh, protects fish in, um, in the warmer waters, and not tunneling. So you can see a little schem schematic cartoon. There's a whole amount, a lot of work done now about this kind of idea of riparian, uh, the riparian corridor, how much, uh, what kind of trees and shrubs you plant, how far back to give that scaling of cover and give that most naturalized scenario. So you have that kind of balance between having sufficient cover to keep the waters cool and also having sufficient amount of diversity to allow food and feeding into the river. The next thing you start looking at is thermal refugia. In other words, cold spots for all extents and purposes. So you're, maybe you're talking about deeper pools. And um, so if you're excavating pools in a river, you may have to get deeper so that the deeper parts of the world can stay cooler. Water flow, how fast is water flowing? Because again, if you repair back to that uh, little photograph I showed you at the start of the presentation, the river feel and the one in the river deal, there was virtually no water flow. So all the water does, even though it's a river, it, it flows at such a low level that effectively heats up. So maybe can you adjust and ensure there's kind of fast water flow and also providing that shading. And in some cases, I know some of the studies in America that are looking to see how can you utilize existing groundwater or spring-fed uh, spring streams to try and provide some of this thermal refugia. So an example, uh, this is a paper taken from the journal Ecohydrology. So it's preserving, augmenting, and creating cold water thermal refugia on the Miramichi River in New Brunswick in Canada. So they're looking at saying, well, what can we do here to put, it, put in these, uh, these cool spots um, that will allow at least uh, fish to be able to go to when water temperatures get too high. So there's refuges, there's like little refuges where they can go where they, their thermal optima are, are okay. An example here is just, now this particular image is not related to the paper, but it gives an, an idea of how you're looking at satellite imagery of temperatures of a river to see where the hot spots are and what you can do. And that little river is kind of a more naturalized channel. So in some of those, what you can see in some of the bends, you may be able to excavate out much deeper spots for fish. But one of the concerns there is, that if you have fish spread out over the entire length of a river, a chunk of river, and you have only relatively small thermal refugia, all the fish have to go to the one place. And what does that do then in terms of the available habitat for feeding or growing and things like that? So there's, there's implications. So what we're doing a lot of at the moment in RFI, and again, the climate change video gives a good sense of it, is remote monitoring of temperature. You can use satellite monitoring, local term, uh, um, um, temperature monitors to understand the longer term impacts, but also the shorter term impacts, because the more information we have in terms of those impacts, the better we can plan our fishery development works and our adaptation works. But the question, of course, um, from us, and there's a few people here, I suppose, would be, what about lakes? Well, lakes are a different ball of wax because, again, it depends on the trophic status of the individual lakes. Some are deep, cold, carry lakes. Some are shallow, midland-type lakes. Some are the kinds of lakes up in the midlands, the Calvin Mountains, that are absolutely chock full of uh, lovely coarse fish and pike and things like that. What can you do in lakes? So just give you a very quick whistle stop on the lakes. And this, this is kind of, a, I suppose, a... Um, uh, what do you call it, um, hydromorphology 101, is lake waters tend to cycle over the course of the year. So if you look at the first top left-hand part of the graph, you've got this idea of summer where you end up with a stratification of the water temperatures in the lakes. And the top of the lake is called the epilimnion, right, where it gets warmer. You have this little thing called thermocline. That's a very small, narrow band uh, where there's a very distinct change in temperatures and then a hypolimnion. So in a classic lake, what you'll find in the warmer summer temperatures is that um, some of the cooler water species will migrate to the bottom and the more warmer water species will stay up around the top. And there's a, what they call a kind of a spatial separation of habitat in the lake, which is fantastic. But the question I again ask is, how sustainable is that in terms of habitat loss or availability of food in the deeper parts of the lake? Is that good for all of the fish down there? Or will there be a competitive advantage for the fish at the warmer part of the lake that it can get better feeding? 
you can see over the fall, and obviously this is an American kind of graphic, in the, in the autumn there's an overturn, so the water tends to turn around. In the winter, where sometimes it might be freezing uh, uh, a layer of um, ice on the lake, the, you have a uniform water temperature of four degrees Celsius, in which case the cooler water species are probably not doing too bad, and the, more, uh, the cold or the warmer water species are probably at a disadvantage, and you get that turning in spring. But the real thing about lakes is what can you do in the, 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 um, the lakes? And really at the moment, there's not an awful lot that can be done in lakes. Some groups are experimenting with putting in structures and things like that that allows fish to actually hide under, and they can hide from predation as well as, you know, in terms of thermal. But if you have a shallow bottom lake, um, there's not really that many things that can be done. You can do things around the margins and like try and put your vegetation, but it's very difficult to try and put shading or any of those kind of normal things into a lake. And um, one of the big issues, it's certainly from the Salmon, it's in, in case some of the courses as well, that sometimes it, it move into out of rivers and lakes is that if you have very, very low water conditions, um, the link between the river and the lake may actually be broken. So there may be something to do there where fish can move out of the lake into cooler river water conditions or faster flowing river water conditions. Um, so there might be some works around that, but really it's a difficult one to call. Um, so finally, I'm going to leave you a second, but finally, leave this lovely photograph here, taken not by me, unfortunately, but by one of my colleagues uh, in Norway. And they've got this lovely idea. This is a, a beautiful sea trout that's come into a lake and it's just about to go to a river to spawn in, in, in Norwegian winter. It's a beautiful photograph. And the very last slide I'd like to leave you with is, is the uh, video I just referenced a couple of times in the talk is the climate change project, how low water temperatures and high temperatures impact on angling. So they've talked about the climate change change project, but also specifically in angling. It's available on this YouTube link, uh, but I think the links, the, again, if you go searching for Gold Fishing Week, uh, all the videos will be up there. So I think at that point, I'm, uh, I'm going to stop there and take, I think we have a couple of questions and I'm happy to take. Um, Fantastic. Yes. Thank you, uh, Kieran, for that for that really fascinating in-depth uh, PowerPoint and presentation on, uh, on climate change and, and about our inland waterways. Um, I thought it was really interesting interesting to hear about you know the different climate tre trends in Ireland over the last uh, 15 years um, but yes we do have some uh, questions that have come in and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to my colleagues Aideen and Rachel who've been busy in the background collating all those questions for you and they're going to put them to you now. Okay super I see some on the on the WhatsApp do are they the chat do you want me to read the yeah. ones in the chat box? No, no, we we'll, we can deal with those there for yeah, if you yeah. want. Um, so yes, yeah, so there's one you coming in here just um, about the, given the vast uh, climate change impacts that you have outlined with respect to Atlantic salmonoid, Arctic char, mm. and other species, and on various Irish rivers, together with the very significant pressures impacting on water quality, with particular focus uh, in the upcoming third cycle on agricultural hydromorphological, including ongoing drainage works and forestry pressures, are we doing enough to protect, restore and conserve our rivers, fish species and riparian zones? If not, what needs to be done right now at a policy level and enforcement level in advance of 2030, which is nine years away, and 2050, which is 29 years away? And I'll just sort of combine that in with another question, which is asking about the pollen char and shad, which was talked about yesterday, and do you think we'll lose these? So yeah, okay, wow, that's a, quite a mouthful. I suppose, <laughs> but the answer is, because one of my other talks in terms of the salmon world, I often talk about this idea of controlling the controllables. So salmon in particular, we know that marine mortality has been a big problem. So when you go out to sea, for various reasons, whether it's temperature, food and all the rest, they're not coming back in the numbers that they used to come back. So 1980s, maybe 20% of salmon come back now, maybe 7%. But we can't control what happens in North Atlantic or way off beyond Iceland. So we're controlling the controllable. So are we doing enough? The answer is we're doing a lot, but we could be doing more. So if you went back now, for example, we manage salmon at individual river base, uh, river level. And so every, nearly every impediment to salmon getting back up to a river to spawn has been removed in terms of commercial netting. We've put in uh, um, issues around fish passage. We've put in things uh, to remove um, the, the angling restrictions and regulations and things like that. But the, the question reference water quality, we've seen a really precipitous decline in what they call a pristine quality, high, high, high status water quality sites. And that's a concern. So overall water quality has improved quite a lot, but the really high quality, the blue dot sites have decreased. And that's a concern because it's where salmon tend to breed. Are we doing enough? We're doing a huge amount of work now, really getting in on under the barriers because the barriers of fish passage, both for fish going up and for smalls going down is a problem. And also we're starting in terms of this presentation, 
we're doing an awful lot of work on this idea of the, the riparian corridor and having a much more cohesive approach to the riparian corridor. So I suppose we're doing a lot. Could we do more? Absolutely, I think so. But the, the key thing is that the, the question I mentioned about 2030, 2050 policies, these are feeding, these kind of ideas are feeding much more into things like the common agricultural policy and various other policies. There's a much greater consideration of the environment impacts. But yes, a lot done. I think I was a famous political party said a while ago, a lot done, more to do. In relation to the second part of the question about the pollens, the shads um, and the chars, pollens and chars, um, uh, I think shads are slightly different, but pollens and char, char are effectively cold water lake species. We've lost a lot of char, and I don't have the figure to hand, but we certainly, like, I think of 95, we lost uh, um, char from Loch Carib. You know, so in recent decades, we've lost char from a number of lakes. Uh, and we've lakes where we think they may be present, um, but you have to be very careful when you're trying to sample them, because what you don't want to do is go into a lake to sample the char and realize you've just, you know, taken them out. But like, when you're talking about this, this interplay between temperature, other species, I know in some lakes, particularly in, in Connemara, we, 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 we've perch introduced and perch do particularly well and they're out competing char. So these kind of things are likely to happen more and more. Shad, uh, slightly different, but yeah, again, we'll be under pressure. And broadly speaking, what you're finding is the cooler water species are moving north and all at a European level, those other species are moving in. I mentioned we've 20, 28 fish species. All you have to do is look over the hedge, look at England, uh, look at France and see, well, what potential species could potentially make their way across? Because all of a sudden, Ireland is now suitable temperatures to be able to you know, host a population of whatever species. Thank you, Kieran. And we have uh, one last question from Rachel. Hi, it's another question's come in here. Where do fish go in those high floods and do they get washed away? That's another good one. Yeah, it is. Um, and <laughs> it's kind of a hard one because mostly, mostly we're not in those high floods. Um, but broadly speaking, I think a lot of them try. And if you see that flood coming down, you will find typically there's kind of side eddies off those floods. So what we find is I think many fish species tend to kind of hang on. But you have to be careful. It depends on what we're looking at and when. Because if you were looking at an eel, uh, eels tend to move on the big floods and what they call the dark. So when they migrate in the autumn time, the October, November, the, think about the dirtiest, wet, darkest flooding night you could think about. That's when the eels are migrating out to sea, right? So that's the darks. Whereas that kind of a flood that I showed you in New England in September, what you would have, and that's a typically a salmon river, those fish would have come upstream, depending if there was spring salmon, the salmon, that also might have been in the, that river system from maybe springtime, maybe February, March, April, they're upstream. And what they'd be doing is hanging around on their journey further up to the really small streams to, to spawn. So what they would be typically trying to do is get the, basically get the hell out of the way um, and, and to those side. And they answer the second part, do they get washed out? Yes, they do. You can have a situation in some cases, and, and I have to get the physiology on this, but fish can actually drown because they get such pressure on them, they can't move their gills and breathe, they can actually drown. It sounds funny, but that does happen in some of those kind of large scale flood events. But broadly speaking, those kind of big flood events are not good for fish populations.